lies and fairy tales. No, um, the reality is we have had people either directly involved in fender benders or um, people like going by and seeing things. So we're all straggling in. Um, some people have turned around to go home, and uh, hopefully they'll make it home. This was not the morning that many people were expecting. It's good to see you this morning. And it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Joel, good to see you, brother. I'm just glad you're okay. Quite a few people on 149. Yeah, 149. Don't go that way. It's okay. 149. Stay right here. And I just always, quite frankly, get a little... We try the church is a place that faithfully engages and wrestles with the truths of the gospel, both to encourage us in our faith journey as well as to help us uh, to grow being real, how amazing and important it is to follow him. With that being said, please grab your bulletin. These are the things that we want to make sure you're aware of. Uh, one night, uh, two people like us, the team prayer will be at the Black's house at 6.30, so parents and teens just be with there. Also, just a reminder to the stewards and elders, we do have a leadership meeting here tomorrow night at 6.30. Tuesday, ladies. Uh, thank you for your flexibility, uh, and uh, your rescheduled fellowship will be here at the church on Tuesday, and Lord willing, that will all work out. Saturday, Laser Tag Fellowship, by the way, it includes Bumper Cars, Bouncy House, um, except, you know, unless you're of a certain size or whatever, and karaoke, um, yeah, that's not going to happen. All right. Um, <laughs> oh, come on. Don't be a part of Uber. You just go right ahead. I'll record everything. Um, <laughs> This is the last day to sign up because it would be helpful for us just to have a sense of how many are coming uh, and all that. Also, however, we do want to make sure you just remember that you and whoever you're responsible for would pay at the door, uh, and that will make things a little bit easier in that regard. But if you could just let us know um, uh, if you're coming or not, that would be great. Um, I haven't signed up. I'm not going to pass it around, but if you want to come, just And if you don't want to do any of those things, but you still want to come hang out, you can do that at no cost. So the, the cost is simply if you're going to utilize the things. Um, parents, just a reminder, uh, just in case you're wondering, this is not a drop-off opportunity. Uh, we do require at least one parent to be there with their children um, and all of that. So Jackson, I mean, you can drop him off. We'll, we'll watch it. Um, so... Next Sunday, we continue in our journey of worship with uh, Advent and Samuel, and uh, we will have Digging Deeper. And then also next Sunday, 3 o'clock, if you're interested, Joel, where are we going to gather? Um, we're going to we're gonna gather where we usually gather, right there at the uh, cemetery, the, okay. right in town. Main um, Street in Hartford, yeah. cemetery. Cemetery. Uh, we all gather there, and um, we just basically march up and down part of We don't do the whole street, don't worry. We do part of uh, Main Street. Times gotten uh, people out and watching and listening, and other times people telling us to go away. So you know, <laughs> uh, church photo directory pictures. If you sign up for today, please make sure that that gets done. Also, if you look nice today, you haven't signed up for today. Just come and get your picture taken this week or next week or sometime. Just otherwise, I'm going to come and get you. <laughs> so, the gauntlet has been thrown. She's quick, she's efficient, I highly recommend her. Um, I did list for you all of the holiday uh, services. So just very quickly, the, mo the biggest one I want you to be aware of, Christmas Eve, because it's a Saturday, we thought it would actually be helpful uh, for you as families, whatever you may have, for those who have Christmas Eve traditions. The service will be at 4.30, it should be done right around 5.30, 
and that will enable you to do whatever family functions you may have that evening. So that will be Saturday, uh, Christmas Eve, 4.30, just about an hour. December 25th will be a Christmas Day service. Um, fairly regular service with some extra music. No Sunday school or digging deeper. And then the same thing for New Year's Day. It will be a regular service. Uh, I'll be taking a break uh, out of Samuel that day. Uh, and that will just be uh, a regular service. No Sunday school or digging deeper. Update on Jerry. Jerry was able, by the grace of God, to go in and have her surgery. Uh, so we were very thankful for that. And it sounds like it went well. So now the long uh, journey of recovery. But the big thing that we were all concerned about at least was resolved. And that was that when they opened her up, she did not have infection. So she was able to get that done. So we give thanks to God for that. Can, what's that? Oh, hi, Jerry. Um, please be in prayer for Judy Tuesday, you said? Tuesday, Judy will be having carpal tunnel surgery, so please be in prayer. This is a uh, third time, so we're praying that this will work. Um, so please be in prayer for her regarding that. Continue to pray for Annalise Holcomb and her knees and the journey she's going to be going through. And uh, just being aware of the fact that that's going to be an ongoing challenge for her uh, throughout her life. So just being of her. So that is any other announcements or reminders at this point? Oh, Tuesday, we have women's. I already did that. Oh, you did? I'm sorry. I was trying to change Yeah, you should have focused on Tuesday. Tuesday. <laughs> I'm used to it. Okay. All right. Please also just keep in prayer for anybody that uh, uh, had uh, car trouble this morning or accidents and be mindful of that. Pray for Connie getting home. <laughs> she hates driving. Please open your Bibles to 1 Samuel 3. 1 Samuel chapter 30. Now when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day, the Amalekites had made a raid against the Negev and against Ziklag. They had overcome Ziklag and carried them off and went their way. And when David and his men came to the city, they found it burned with fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. David's two wives also had been taken captive, Ahimenemen of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. But David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abathar the priest, the son of Himelech, bring me the ephod. So Abathar brought the ephod to David, and David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue after this band, shall I overtake them? He answered him, pursue, for you shall surely overtake, and shall surely rescue. So David set out, and the six hundred men were with, who were with him, and they came to the brook Bezor, where those who were left behind stayed. But David pursued, he and four hundred men, two hundred stayed behind, who were too exhausted to cross the brook Bezor. They found an Egyptian in the open country and brought him to David, and they gave him bread, and he ate. They gave him water to drink, and they gave him a piece of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, the spirit revived. Uh, his spirit revived, for he had not eaten bread or drunk water for three days and three nights. And David said to him, To whom do you belong, and where are you from? He said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amicalite, and my master left me behind because I fell sick three days ago. We had made a raid against the Negev of the Cherethites and against that which belongs to Judah, and against the Negev of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. David said to him, Will you take me down to this band? And he said, Swear to me by God that you will not kill me or deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will take you down to this band. And he taken him down. Behold, they were spread abroad over all the land, eating and drinking and dancing because of the great spoil they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. And David 
struck them down from twilight until the evening of the next day. And not a man of them escaped, except 400 young men who mounted camps and fled. David recovered all that the Amicalites had taken, and David rescued his two wives. Nothing was missing, whether small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything that had been taken. <coughs> David brought back all. David also captured all the flocks and herds, and the people drove the livestock before him and said, This is David's spoil. Then David came to the 200 men who had been too exhausted to follow David, and who had been left at the brook Basil. And they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with him. And when David came near to the people, he greeted them. Then all the wicked and worthless fellows among the men who had gone with David said, Because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except that each man may lead away his wife and children and depart. But David said, You shall not do so, my brothers, with what the Lord has given has preserved us and given into our hand the band that came against us. Who would listen to you in this matter? For as his share is who goes down into the battle, so shall his share be who stays by the battle. They shall share alike. And he made it a statute and a rule for Israel from that day forward to this day. When David came to Ziklag, he sent part of the spoil to his friends, the elders of Judah, saying, here is a present for you from the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. It was for those in Bethel, in Ramoth, of the Negev, in Jatir, in Aor, in Zithmoth, in Eshtemo, in Rakal, in the cities of the Jeremiahites, in the cities of the Canaanites, in Hormon, in Borsham, in Thach, in Hebron, all the places where David and his men Blessed Father, we bow our heads before you and we praise you. We give you thanks. We are humbled. And I just pray, Lord, that as we continue forward in this month of December, as we continue forward in the Christmas season, as we consider the truth that Advent is fulfilled, and yet we wait another Advent. <clears throat> Father God, I am grateful for the joy that we can have of following the sign. That you have given us the gift of faith to believe. And therefore my prayer for all that are here is that you would deepen our faith, that you would grow our faith, that we would live our lives based on our faith, that we would know both with heart and faith and experience your love, the hope comes from your love and the joy that comes from abiding in you. For you are God. Father, we are so very grateful on behalf of Jerry. Thank you for hearing our prayers and thank you for blessing her with the grace of her surgery. And we pray, Lord, now that you would just help her to be steadfast in her journey of recovery. But Father, thank you so very much for blessing her trial and granting her grace at the end of it. Father God, we are mindful for um, for the Holcomb family, especially Annalise right now, just with some of the issues she's been having with her knees. We pray, Father, for Judy and just grant her grace and strength to endure uh, not only her surgery on Tuesday, but then what comes after that. And Father, we pray above all else that it will be a, an effectual surgery. Father, we're grateful that uh, Chris Higby is doing well and recovering well. And we just pray for the ongoing journey uh, to recover, to uh, basically relearn how to use certain joints, in this case, for her ankle. Father, we pray that you would just continue to grant us mercy as we face our realities. That we would not look to other things. That we would not ignore what is in front of us. That we would not numb ourselves to what is in front of us. But that we would rely on you. That people might actually see our faith in action. That we ourselves might be encouraged by one another's journey. So Father, may this morning just be yet again another important reminder of your mercy and love. And we 
we praise you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. reality of life. One thing we have always found interesting is how something that is meant to be a time of rest, a different pace than the normal life, often becomes more stressful and even full of sadness. The holidays in the American culture are so overrun with marketing and spending, and because of that, we have definitely lost the special aspect of celebration, slowing down and enjoying people in a way that normal life oftentimes doesn't allow. The holidays the whole Christmas season has become this collection of things we do more than we experience and enjoy. Luke 2, 1 through 7. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius, the governor of Syria, and that all should be registered in each in his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee from the town of Nazareth to Judah, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because it was the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time for her to came to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. Luke 2, 8 through 20. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you, you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw him, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard, as it had been told them. The life of a shepherd in ancient times was spent doing a lot of watching, settling, watching and managing the flock as they eat, drink, sleep, and then move to a new spot to start it all over again. All the while trying to make sure none of them, none of the sheep run off, nor some other creature come along and make one of them his dinner. One could argue there's not a lot about this life of a shepherd that is filled with upward movement or much that'll keep you interested or feel meaningful. It was a lowly job. The night Jesus was born presented the world with its first Christmas. The celebration began with the angels. They proclaimed to the shepherds that the birth of this child would be a focus of great joy for all for a shepherd who saw very little and did not have much of an ordinary, out of the ordinary happen, this was quite a moment and a very special message. But was it true? The lowly shepherds went out and discovered this special kingly Christ child who was born in a lowly man manger to a lowly family and yet Angels pronounced his birth and proclaimed his arrival, saying his life would bring great joy. He 
he was real. But would this proclamation prove true? Well, we know it did, but only through great sorrow. As we celebrate the advent of Messiah, our Messiah, may we recognize that no matter how stressful the holidays can be, we can choose to slow down and focus on the joy we have in Christ. We can, we need to let the joy be evident to all. Sam, as I was walking in, uh, 40, 149 is like a brand new pair of uh, church shoes on an ice rink. <laughs> it's, it's like, so I would recommend that. And usually we don't do that. But, uh, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his back, on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. Prince of Peace. Please stand with me and sing 247. I just worship and adore him.
we understand this passage correctly, love is not only defined by God, God is love. And because of God's love, in order to redeem that which was lost in the garden, he sent his son to be our savior, to be our redeemer. That was a decision for the foundation of the world in order to reclaim that which was lost. And he did it because he is love, out of his love. But understand this, that being sent wasn't enough. Jesus lived a sinless life. He faced the temptations of sin. And then he suffered death as the substitutionary atonement for sin. God, out of his holiness and grace, resurrected the Son in fulfillment of his plan, of his word, then established the Son of Man upon the eternal throne. All of that because God is love. However, it is also the reality of the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus sitting on the throne, that we not only see God's love in action, we actually can live our lives under real, substantial hope. It wasn't enough that Jesus died for our sin and was buried. But then out of God's holiness and grace, raise him to life. And the second that happens, now death, the ultimate penalty for sin, is now paid for, dealt with, undone. Jesus now holds the keys. And therefore all who believe in him no longer have to worry or fret. Their greatest need is now met. And yet it is a faith, it is a hope. That any of us that are alive wait for. It. But it's a substantial hope. It's not hoping in a person. It's not hoping in money. It's not hoping in anything other than the resurrected Messiah. And yet, not only did God reveal his love in Jesus, not only is Jesus the substance of our hope, Jesus is our joy. Now here's where it gets a little complicated. We have somehow bought into this idea that joy and happiness are equated as equal. They're not. Joy is not a feeling of humanity. Joy is knowing the Father, abiding in the Father, obeying the Father, which is what Jesus gets to in John 15. Ending in John 15, verse 11. In other words, when we abide in the Father through the Son, we have joy. But then how well do we engage it? So we realize and engage our joy when we intentionally seek, obey, worship, and honor the Father in our daily living. That's how we discover this. It's, it's a gift given, and yet it needs to be engaged with and held on to. Because let's be honest, we all know that at any point in time, on any given day, something can come along. And we use the phrase, steal our joy. What it really is, is that we're ignoring our joy. We're laying it down. And so today... We will see David as he moves from being at a distance from his joy in the Lord to being reminded how important and powerful it is in his daily life. And oh, by the way, I will show this to you without the word joy being mentioned once. So let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your mercy and grace. I thank you for who you are. I thank you for the depth of your word. Now help us to grow in it, I pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now, chapter 29, I didn't read it, but chapter 29, verses 1 through 5, uh, there's a bit of a rumbling amongst the five leaders of the Philistine kingdom. Remember, there are five city-states ruled by five kings, and sometimes they do things together, sometimes they do things individually. Well, they have marched.
marched out to war together against Israel. And in verses 1 through 5, the Philistine rulers made Achish send David and his troops back to Ziklag. What happens is, is that they are doing some type of parading in front of the five rulers. And four of the rulers see David and his men. And they, they're like looking at each other going, who are these Hebrews in the midst of our army? I mean, it's not like David and his group is a small group. It's 600 guys. And I think as Alex or somebody a couple weeks ago pointed out, there would be distinction of dress and armor and weaponry. So it, it was actually a pretty easy thing to spot in the middle of their Philistine army. And they're like, what are they doing here? Who's that? Well, Ziklag, I'm sorry, Achish, I always get, I, yeah, I've been doing that all week in my notes. Achish says, oh, they're with me. That's David. You know, the guy killed Goliath. And, well, yeah, I mean, what you, let me get there. I mean, come on. Okay, fine. You want to do this? Um, with no mentioning of the Lord, keep this in mind. Remember, when we left David in the story, it looked like he was painted in a corner. It looked like David was going to have to do a horrible thing, and that was fight against fellow Hebrews. So with no mentioning of the Lord, the four Philistine kings are distressed, and therefore they solve David's problem. Because when they hear about Achish and this relationship that he's had with David and his men for over a year, the four kings <coughs> become angry with Achish and insist he send them back to wherever he's assigned them because they do not want to risk David turning <coughs> on them in the midst of battle. In other words, they remember that David has killed <coughs> the 10,000 of the Philistines. And that was probably a better number. It's sort of like a fish story. They don't want him there. They do not want him there. David's problem has all of a sudden been solved. But then you get to verses 6 to 11. So Achish kind of hangs his head. Because I think he really liked having David. And, you know, as his personal bodyguard. And, you know, he thought he was hot stuff. Because he had the, the giant slayer with him. And he talks with David, urging him to return to the village in peace. Achish explains the situation to David. Insisting that this is not of his own choosing, Achish <laughs> ironically refers to David's credibility and honesty three times, which is unfortunate because David has been nowhere near honest or upright with him. David clearly has this guy duped. And what's interesting is David actually appears to argue the point, seeming to want to go to battle against Israel and Saul. However, as mentioned earlier, it seems that David has, let's be honest, carefully developed this deception. He's been deceiving Achish from day one. And therefore, it is at least reasonable to see his insistence as a desire to be there in the fight in order to help save Saul and the army of Israel. That's at least a reasonable conclusion. Furthermore, David's comment when he says that I may do not go and fight against the enemies of my lord, the king. He says it in a way that is so vague that while Achish could clearly think that he was referring to him, David could have just been, as easily been referring to Saul or more likely to the Lord. David is playing a little bit loose and fast with the truth. But with that being said, there's no reason to believe that David was actually intending at any point in time to fight against Israel. But that he would use the moment to kill and help save Saul and the army. Now, here's what's also interesting. While God is never mentioned in this chapter, it is important to note that God's intervention most likely was not to save David from a foolish decision, but more likely to keep David from saving Saul. Or, another way to put it, to keep David from being anywhere near the death of Saul. 
it is most likely and most makes sense in terms of, especially as we're going to see how the story unfolds of David being put on the throne in Judah and then ultimately over all Israel, that if David had been even just somewhere in that army, anywhere, and Saul ends up dead, that would allow anyone in Israel to accuse David of horrible things and, quite frankly, hinder him from taking the throne. This is God's hand working to accomplish his purposes. David overstretched. David made a foolish decision. This is a great story to see how God works and shows us even somebody like David isn't big enough to mess up God's plan. So Achish commands David to return to Ziklag because he does not wish the anger of the other kings and commanders of the Philistine army, nor does he want David to stir anything up, especially on the, the cusp of battle. He just says, David, go home in peace. And so David does it. Now, we get to chapter 30, verses 1 to 6. David and his men return to a burned-out home and families taken captive. After three days of travel, obviously they're very weary in traveling, uh, it was about 50 miles. They find out that an unknown raiding party, obviously they do find out later on it's the Amicalites, but up to this point, they just know that their town not only was raided, but burned. However, it was burned out, and everything was stolen, and they didn't find any bodies. So that tells them they were taken by this band. Now, one quick question. You know, we won't spend long on it. Does it say that Saul had wiped out all the Amicalites in chapter 15? Okay. While Saul's campaign in chapter 15 resulted in wiping out the settlements of the Amicalites, clearly he didn't wipe them all out, resulting in an unknown amount of survivors. I've been trying to remind you and tell you over and over again, the Bible is not a, a, a historical record of accuracy. That's not its purpose or function. And then people will say, well, how can we trust it? Because it is God's word, and the focal point is not always going to center around the numbers of something. Saul accomplished the overall mission. He wiped out their settlements. They, be, they had to move. If there were any survivors, it wasn't many. But now it's been many years, so they obviously replenish to some degree. But just understand that Saul also didn't do everything he was told to do. So it's just keeping in mind the point of the stories that we read here. Details matter, and yet to understand that we're not always going to grab a hold of every single historical little detail. Because that's not its purpose. So an Amicalite raiding party does this. No one's been killed, but they also have no idea where to go or if they'll even be able to overtake them. In other words, just think about what you are like when you're exhausted, and then something rather stressful comes along right in the midst of that. It's going to always feel bigger than it is. It's also solutions are going to seem to escape you like there is no solution. And therefore, don't get me wrong, if I came home and my house is burned down and my wife and children all of a sudden I know are gone, I am going to have a great bitterness of soul and spirit. And it's to the point where many, if not most of the men, want to stone David. Two things. One, they make it abundantly clear that David's wives were included in this. In other words, David's loss was equal to theirs. But then the other thing to take note of is that David seeks the Lord. There were some who did wish to stone him. They believed that if different decisions had been made, maybe they could have prevented this. That's common. That's, that's a normal response. But David, unlike his flight from Saul when he went to Philistia, and unlike Saul turning to the witch, here in this moment, he is strengthened. It 
says he strengthened himself <coughs> in the Lord his God. As we know, he has done in the past. David is a lot like us in this one sense. Sometimes he really does well living by his faith, and other times he doesn't. In this moment, he engaged his faith in the Lord. In the midst of great stress, in the midst of great weariness, in the midst of great loss, not knowing the degree of that loss, he strengthens himself in the Lord. He turns to the Lord. David had clearly for a season stopped seeking and relying on the Lord. His despair had grown, and as I said earlier, he laid down his joy in the Lord and in life because he kind of distanced himself from the Lord. Friends, it's you know one purpose David, David himself, you know what his life and all of his writing helps us understand? Is the journey of the, our emotion that it gets included in faith. David truly experienced the joy of the Lord, of what it meant to know and abide in the Lord, to walk and live his life based on the Lord. And therefore, it's a very big contrast when he doesn't. We can read psalm after psalm after psalm before this event takes place. And we can know with utter surety David was engaging what it meant to have the joy of the Lord be his strength. And therefore, we can see the contrast what it looks like when he's laid it down. Like I said, I can point this out to you and the word joy isn't even mentioned because of the type of guy David was. He lived his life seeking the Lord, knowing and understanding the Lord was the sovereign God over the things that happened. And yet he was very case right after that great victory he completely ignores it forgets about it, walks away from it makes a stupid decision goes to Philistia I don't know, maybe it's the shock of not only the, the, the captivity of their families but also the fact that his men want to stone him maybe that jolts him and reminds him of what he's been doing or should I say not been doing and in the end it doesn't matter what we see here in this moment is David turns 180 and he grabs a hold of the Lord. And what's amazing is we're going to get to see instance after instance in these next few verses of what it now looks like again for David to live out of his hope and love and joy in the Lord. In verses 7 to 15, David seeks the Lord's counsel and pursues the raiders to rescue their families. David decides to seek the counsel of the Lord. He asks Abathar, the now new high priest, and says, bring the ephod. And therefore, he asks of the Lord, should we pursue, will we overtake? And God says, yes, pursue. But then God adds to the answer. He doesn't just answer the questions. He says, you shall overtake and rescue. Well, I don't know about you, but that would most certainly bless and encourage my heart. And so David and his men, they go. They go with about 600 men. They travel about 15 miles. Remember, after already traveling about 50 or so miles, and about 200 of them, it says, are basically too exhausted to continue on. However, what I would tell you is, is that this instance is very akin to another story we know, the story of Gideon. Now David's troop is down to 400. They come upon the, an Egyptian, there we say, the Lord's provision, yet again, and he's a slave of one of the Amalekites, meaning he was part of the camp, and we know that because he basically tells David what had happened, and he mentions Ziklag. They take care of him. Was his becoming sick yet again? Another intervention? Yes. I mean, 
If we can't see the hand of God over and over and over again happening from chapter 29, verse 1, all the way through here, friends, God is working. So they talk to the Egyptian, they find out what happened, and they ask him if he can help them find their home base. He says, yes, as long as you promise, don't kill me, and more importantly, don't give me back to them. Well, of course, that's an easy promise to make because David is planning on wiping them all out. There will be no master to return to. But anyways, so in verses 16 to 30, David overcomes, rescues, and then reveals a kingly heart and mind. And what we see here is they do, in fact, find the raiding party. They find them celebrating, and who wouldn't be? Of course, they're having a big party because of the support they got. So most likely, not to say that this is an excuse, but at least part of the story, they're not exactly in fighting condition. That's always a good thing. We are never told how big the group is, but let's just think of it this way. It's a fight that lasts for a whole day. And then we're told that none escape. I, always, I love how this is worded. It says, they wiped them all out, none escaped, well, except for 400. That's not a small number. It says 400 young escape on camels. Okay. However, if the fight took all day, and 400 are left over. That's probably a pretty decent size. In other words, David's group of 400 overcame an enemy considerably larger than that. That's the point. But even more so to the point, it tells us they recovered and rescued everything. The deliverance was complete. It wasn't just a little bit. It wasn't just some of it. It wasn't that some of the wives were dead or some of the kids. The entire rescue and recovery was complete. And actually, it wasn't just complete. It was more. And so the families are reunited. David actually has to spend some time mediating between the four, some of the 400 and the 200. Um, I don't know if you pick this up when you read out of chapter 30. And it says, Then all the wicked and the worthless fellows among the men who had gone with David said. That's actually the exact same description or very similar to what was mentioned about uh, some of the men in chapter 10, uh, verse 27, that stood opposed to Saul's kingship. And David has to mediate between them because they were saying, as worthless men, hey, these 200, they didn't go, they don't deserve any of the spoil. And David said, no, nah, it doesn't work that way. Now, here's why, by the way. You know, the Bible says if you don't work, you don't need. So you would think the principle would be, no, you're right. Sorry, guys, you don't get any. But here's why David shares the spoil. What does he make abundantly clear? Brothers... And by the way, it's not insignificant that, G that David calls them brothers. And he says, brothers, how could we do that with what the Lord has given us? Now, some of the 400 might be saying, wait a second, David, that was not a gift. We had to work hard for that. <laughs> yeah, but keep in mind, you should be dead. They outnumbered you two to one, three to one, four to one. However big it was, you were outnumbered, you were outgunned. You didn't deserve to walk out of there. The Lord gave this to us. And so David says, you know what? <clears throat> if you go and stay with the bad guys, you get the same. But what's really interesting is by calling them brothers, David is now revealing the importance of being a covenant and so what you see here is David not only cares for his men, he offers portions of the spoil to all the various places throughout the wilderness of Judah that had either suffered under the raid and or were places that David and his men had stopped at throughout the last few years. Now, let's take a big picture look. David seeks the Lord in verse 6. He recognizes the Lord's provision and the victory, and he offers the spoil fairly, both to his men and to the people of Judah. 
all of this is showing a radical shift from chapter 27, where David had despaired. David is showing more and more a heart for God and a kingly spirit that finishes with David ultimately being placed on the throne, working towards a united kingdom. This is exactly what you want from a covenant king. And it all comes out of the fact that David trusts in and believes in, hopes in the Lord his God, and is engaging in the joy of the Lord, which is his strength, both in terms of trial and hardship, as well as good times. Our joy isn't the feeling of happiness. Our joy is the understanding that as I abide in God, life is as and where it needs to be and should be. It's on the journey that God wants for me. And I can be at peace with that. And I can have joy in that, even if it's hard, even if it's not what I want. And David had forgotten that. He had laid that down for a while. <clears throat> but now he's picked it up again. And it shows in the way that he does things and why he does things. Joy isn't going to be the feelings that you have. Joy is going to be the manner in which you live for. And it is either the joy of the Lord or something far less meaningful. And that's always going to be fleeting. Just like happiness. I hope you kept track of all the moments, or I, I would encourage you maybe go back through chapter 29 and 30 this week during the devotions and see God's multiple interventions on behalf, now watch this, on behalf of his plan and purposes, not interventions to simply help David. The four angered kings of Philistia, the removal of David from the place where Saul would die, the insistence he returned to Ziklag quickly. The clear response to go and overtake and rescue. The Egyptian slave. The victory over the larger force. The complete rescue of family and belongings and the added spoil. God never, never, no, never stops working to accomplish his plans and purposes. He never goes on vacation. He never overlooks. He never goes to sleep. He never falls on the job. God is always working to accomplish his purposes. That's the point of this story. David's just the figure that he does it through. And as I've mentioned before, while none of us are called to be covenant kings, as his children, we could plug our name in there and be equally part of it. We are part of it. I hope you believe that. I hope you believe and understand that God's working in and on you constantly, around you, for his purposes, therefore for you as he involves you. It's a never-ending thing. Yes, life gets really burdensome. I really would love to go over and pull the dial back, but then I'd probably just make it a, another mess. Maybe it's a little different, but it's still a mess. We keep facing the reality that David is, in fact, imperfect and not always obedient. Therefore, David was never the promised Messiah. He wasn't the promised seed of Genesis chapter 3. <clears throat> But there's a lot of instances where you can understand why there would be hope. But more importantly, David did in fact point us forward. We do see in David's life the times where his joy was in the Lord, the times where David was unwavering in faith, wholeheartedly given to what the Lord was doing and what the Lord had for him. And this is what joy is all about. A complete immersion in the Father, walking in peace with his choices for our lives, including the times we endure hardship. We may not like, in fact, we often do not like the trial, the hardship, but our hearts are joyous in our walk 
with the Father as we go through the hardship with Him. Friends, there is no other pathway to true, lasting joy. We see the times David lived in joy, the times where he did not. However, with Jesus, he always walked in joy of the Father, joy in the Father. <clears throat> Jesus lived a life of joy, and he wants to share that joy with all who believe in him. The raiding party was the moment where David kind of awoke to his need of the Father again. And in the midst of that trial, he sought the Lord, finding not only strength, but his joy. We see the fruit of that and how he then behaved as a leader and future king. It's the only time our lives are going to make sense. The move in the most effective, meaningful way is when we start with beholding and trusting his love. Having hope in our present because of the future he promises. And to embrace the joy that is ours in Christ that overcomes all aspects of life. <clears throat> I'm not saying every day is going to be full of a smile. God isn't wanting his children to go through life with phony responses. Actually, he's trying to enable us to have the most genuine response to everything we go through. And joy and hope and love all centering around God and our faith in Christ is what gives us the means to be genuine. But it requires the exercising of it, the claiming it, the intentional focusing of it. As I said, our, our, I understand why we use the phrase, but I, don't, I just don't think it's very helpful in our circumstance has a way of dictating our feelings. And I get that. I do it too. But our feelings are not meant to be the driver. The love of God. Our hope in God. The joy of the Lord. These are the things that are meant to drive our lives. Jesus' birth was the good news that brought great joy because for the first time since the fall, friends, sin was no longer the only choice. That's one reason why Jesus' birth was great joy. We could now know God again, and God did, in fact, all the labor needed to make it happen. This is the point of the life of David, to show us that <clears throat> Remember, God's interventions were not for David, they were for his late God's labor that included David. David was his vessel, was his servant, was his anointed. But it was God's purposes and God's plans that he was protecting and preserving and working. We get to see the same thing in the perfect life of Jesus who showed us God's labor in person so that we might have joy in him once again, just like Adam and Eve did before the fall. To know what it was to abide with the Father, they knew great joy. And now in Christ, we can too. How great our joy. Blessed Father, it is my prayer that we would look at these stories and to truly see your magnificence, to see your intervention, to see your labor, and to understand that your labor is because of your love. Your labor gives us hope. Your love and your hope and who you are provide the reality of joy, for it is in relationship with Father, I pray, help us to grab our joy because it's you. And to live by faith. Father, I just thank you for your steadfast love. We praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Amen.
is the lamb who was slain. Did you receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise? Please stand with me. As now.
voice is true. And that truth is then what feeds all the other things that we can cling to by faith on any given day. And you know what the greatest truth for me is? Is that he's given it to us together. That we don't walk this alone as individuals, but we are his church. And that's why it's called communion. For if nothing else, it's not a politic, it's not an ideal, it's not a feeling, it's a truth that unites us in his Christ. So that when he gave his body, it was symbolized in the bread. When he shed his blood, it was symbolized in the grape. And so we partake together. For as often as you do this, do this in remembrance. and everything, uh, and just some families weren't able to make it, including some teachers. We are not going to have digging deep for our Sunday school today, so you can fellowship as long as you want, but you are free to go. Have a most blessed day.